Hello and welcome to Meta TV, the YouTube channel of Meta 25, DM25's Italian party. Today we are joined by Drew Michael, Lebanese Northern Irish Procademic on ethnic conflict management, refugees, and violent extremism. He's also a fellow at the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy and at Queen's University Belfast. Drew, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for joining, um, allowing me to join, I should say. Um, I'm okay. Uh, I'll be honest, it's like the last couple of days and the last week has been very um, full of worry and stress. So I really appreciate the chance to talk about it today with you guys. Yeah. Where are you joining us from? I am in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, normally I'm based here, a lot of work here um, and live out of here, but I usually spend half my year in Beirut at least and uh, going backwards and forwards to London as well. Right. And exactly uh, starting from, you know, what you were bringing up and, mm -hmm. you know, where that you have lived and worked in uh, Lebanon. And so you, you know, uh, the area extremely well. You're an expert. Uh, we wanted to talk about, yeah, last week uh, when hundreds of pagers, as well as other communication devices carried by Hezbollah militant group uh, members, uh, mm -hmm. you know, officials and fighters, exploded simultaneously in Lebanon, uh, including in the capital of Beirut. Uh, thousands have been injured and over 20 people have been killed as a result of these attacks. But now Israel has bombed Lebanon with airstrikes killing nearly 500 people. Um, can you please give us a view of the landscape facing Lebanon at the moment, especially in regards to Israel's Americans and Lebanese leadership's responsibility in it? Sure. So thank you. I think it's good to start just a brief overview of how we got to this point. Um, obviously, a lot of the commentary on Israel and Palestine has begun uh, on October 7, which I'm sure is very frustrating for a, a lot of us who have followed the conflict and know the deep-rooted history. I don't want to go that far, um, but basically Hezbollah uh, grew up within the Lebanese civil war of 1975 to 1990. And at the end of that conflict, uh, which was very, very much an intra-Lebanese conflict, Hezbollah was the only organization that was allowed to keep its weaponry in the 1990 peace agreement, the Taif Accord. Now, it was allowed to keep its weaponry because at that point, Israel, since 1982, had invaded Lebanon, um, then under then president, uh, the potential president Bashir Jumail, and had occupied southern Lebanon. And it was allowed to keep its weapons as a means of resistance against the occupation of southern Lebanon. And throughout the years, it engaged in a series of conflicts and uh, with the Leb uh, with the Israeli army based in the south to eventually its um, retreat in 2000. Now, the Israel occupation internationally of Lebanon was considered illegal and at in various different scholarship and legal scholarship, the resistance against its occupation was also considered a legal means of resistance. Now, when Israel uh, uh, left uh, Lebanon, it was under some consternation within the Israeli establishment who believed that they shouldn't have given this ground to Hezbollah, which they saw as an Iranian and Syrian proxy. And has continued a discourse of looking to uh, attack Hezbollah and destroy Hezbollah and basically undermine its existence in Lebanon. From 2000 until 2006, there was a lot of shadow, what we would call a shadow conflict between the two states, sometimes occasionally an open conflict, which really exploded in 2006 in the 34-day war um, in which over a thousand Lebanese were killed, where there is direct shelling between uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, infrastructural damage was estimated in the billions, and considering the years-long um, rebuilding an ordinance clearance that Israel left in the south from that conflict and earlier, it had a significant impact. Then from 2006, um, Israel and Hezbollah basically engaged in ever-increasing rhetoric against one another, um, supported, of course, by the and 
the regular intervals and attacks on Gaza, the you know the mowing the lawn moments that the Israeli uh, government engaged in, and we can see an increase in that discourse when Netanyahu came to power. There was also an increase in that discourse when Hezbollah became the largest, uh, effectively the largest political bloc, and was welcomed into the wider Lebanese power sharing governance. So, and whenever you talk about um, the responsibility of the Lebanese government, we have to realize that it's also a power sharing government, a menage of the different uh, ethnic leaderships that exist there. And Hezbollah is the largest Shia organization or representative. Now, it's not a to total Shia representative. There is a lot of dissidents within um, um, the Shia cohort in Lebanon. Um, so it has to be noted that they re they retain by dem dem democracy and elections, a legitimate place in the government, which the Netanyahu, uh, successive Netanyahu governments and Israeli governments have completely undermined and have sought to always say that it is, um, it is an Iranian and Syrian proxy that holds weapons illegally now that they have left the country and threatens uh, Syria, uh, Israel's security. Um, now, we have seen... Um, the game shift since October 7. What has happened, obviously, in Gaza um, internationally has come under increasing criticism. Uh, we've seen indictments for uh, leadership in Hamas and leadership in Israel for the method of conduct of war. However, what we've seen also is that increasing allowance um, and lack of condemnation for the Israeli prosecution of its conflict and its violence in Gaza. I don't want to call it a war um, because obviously there's been a lot of um, legitimate criticism about the way they have conducted it, tantamount to war crimes. And the lack of censure from Western supporting states, I feel, has continuously blurred the lines about what is acceptable um, conduct that they can get away with. And the conflict with Hezbollah, as I've explained, is longstanding. Um, it's always seen as a to Israel as a security risk in Lebanon, and it's one that it has always sought to uh, um, to right to effectively from their position to get rid of, because as we know, the Netanyahu government basically survives within Israel by constantly building these security dilemmas by propping up the the significant fear that. Um, citizens may have about their security in the region, which obviously traditionally we've seen Israel engage in a number of wars and a number of wars they have been engaged with throughout um, the decades since its existence. And Hezbollah is another one of these enemies. So since October, we've seen increasing uh, attempts at escalation. The January, um, or first week in January, Israel bombed um, a suburb in Beirut, killing Hamas and Hezbollah commanders. It has bombed an embassy on foreign soil, and it can and it has increasingly engaged in more um, forceful acts of conflict, um, uh, troop mobilization in the south, in the south of Lebanon or in the northern Israeli border, and it has um, it is engaged in firing across the border with tanks that led to the death of, and the death of journalists covering the southern the southern shelling and we've seen this escalation in response hezbollah has basically tried to play a game of hold me back which is trying to increasingly um underline their rhetoric as resistance against israel but hopefully try to not push it over the edge what we've seen in the last two weeks is i think israel basically being bored of waiting. The pager attack and the walkie-talkie attack um, uh, the following day has been a clear escalation. Um, the fact is it's a clear violation of sovereignty, the fact that they couldn't um, assess whether or not this was surgical enough that it wasn't that members of Hezbollah carrying these pagers weren't in uh, public spaces, which they were, uh, deaths of children have occurred, and also um, hospital workers who have also used these kinds of technologies. So it very, very much was a clear case of this is going to escalate. Um, and we've seen in the coming days, as you've rightly rightly said, the, the death toll now over 500 um, from the Lebanese health ministry, that this is moved um, from shadow conflict and a conflict of rhetoric and posture into open warfare. 
Right. And I think it's interesting how the responsibility is just sort of shared, right? Uh, like mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't just come from one party, but it's actually um, in many, in many hands. Um, and kind of on that note, we wanted to ask you um, about, you know, the current landscape of the left, your thoughts on it from, you know, the perspective of this region. Um, hmm. Many on the left shape their politics after identity, right? I think that's pretty, pretty clear. Uh, and that can kind of look in one of its shapes, in one of its forms, as a West versus East approach, right? Uh, right. Which basically sees the people of the two regions as fundamentally incapable of understanding each other and the East as a fundamental victim, mm -hmm. um, including its leaders and whom, you know, in this view then are justifiably uh, simply responding, you know, mm -hmm. to, to the unique evil of, you know, for instance, US imperialism. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically Orientalism in reverse, right? Yeah. Um, do you think, as an expert again in this particular region, so from that perspective, do you think this approach to politics is at all productive or true or intellectually honest? Um, <laughs> or, and if not, you know, what could be an alternative? Um, I I think it's very clear to say that I absolutely don't find it productive, useful, um, morally or ethically or empirically a substantive position to take. Oftentimes, um, I find well-meaning leftists, generally leftists, who I have to explain my deep desire to demilitarize as a Lebanese person who engages in practical and democratic development as small as it is in, in small parts and work um, with different actors. I'm often having to explain the suppression, the acts of um, assassination and murder and oppression that Hezbollah has targeted um, Lebanese citizens who want to do better. Um, they have taken part in the Syrian civil war often you know, on the side, often taking part in sieges and uh, mass starvation in different parts of, this, uh, of the country on behalf of Bashar al-Assad. These are not forces that we, as I, I believe, and I certainly identify as a left-leaning person, should associate with. These are not forces that we should... Um, that we should associate and prop up because it happens to be an enemy of my enemy or it happens to be taking a resistance stance to Israel. Um, so it's important that we have that dynamic. However, it is important to realize that through um, elect successive elections that there is an electorate that supports Hezbollah. And the, the, the absolute goal should be to, um, to move towards a, a demilitarization of the organization. However, there is a security dilemma with the state of Israel, between Lebanon and the state of Israel. And Israel, as I believe this current administration, likes to prop up security dilemmas because it's a way of legitimizing itself. So we are stuck in this quandary that it's very, very difficult to tweet that, right? It's very, very difficult to take a, a very clear and um, substantive stance other than just say um, solidarity with the Lebanese, um, resistance against uh, the, you know, the colonial outpost of Israel in the region. But we really have to do better to have a fuller analysis of, what, of what's going on. And, and I don't think I quite clearly articulated your very good question your your question that your first question was the responsibility right so the responsibility also lies on iran syria and hezbollah to try and move towards um a dialogue which um which lessens tension right now i think that we can all agree that those three actors considering the way that the syrian war um uh, turned out or or Netanyahu's stance that we're not currently inundated with a number of mediating 
um, forces, right? So we're stuck in this perpetual dialogue of tension, ill at ease, um, a potential outbreak of conflict, which at moments like this explodes into real death tolls. Over 50 children have been killed in the, in the last day. Um, the Lebanese are suffering enough since 2019. Uh, it's uh, over 80%, and if you include the refugees that live in the country, which you should, over 90% of the country is under the poverty line. There is no um, call on the street, ver no popular call amongst the wider Lebanese groups, all of them, for war with Israel. We do not, and I consider the, the, the royal we um, in a colonial sense, is that there is, no, there is no profitability for the Lebanese to engage in conflict with Israel whenever we're trying to hold our own leaders under account. And I would suggest that considering um, the long-term long goal of Israel is to ensure security on its northern border um, through a demilitarized Hezbollah, which is the largest non-state actor in the world. So it does pose a significant threat to Israel um, and approved that in 2006. Not an existential threat, but certainly one that could lead to a significant cause of human life, which we should all be concerned with. To support that goal of demilitarizing them, maybe we should engage in better politics. Maybe we should engage in supporting democratic actors within the country of Lebanon to support them rather than give Hezbollah another reason to hold on to weapons, rather than a, a reason to fuel their, their rhetoric that the, the Zionist state to the south will only ever understand force and occupation and violence. Um, if the wider supporters of Israel and in the international community could support those actors within Lebanon, a greater case within the Lebanese state can be made for getting rid of Hezbollah's weapons long term. Now, it's not going to happen overnight because, as we mentioned before, other more powerful regional neighbors do not want the kinds of uh, the kinds of um, a resolution of conflict, but. I suggest that prior to October 7, we saw a beginning of normalized relations between Gulf states and Israel. So great enemies that have long, decades long, had um, official stances of conflict towards Israel can come to the table and create agreements. It's not publicly viable to announce those agreements considering what's happened in Gaza, but the, they are possible. So I think that if a wider diplomatic um, attempt to, could be made. Obviously, this ties into supporting a Palestinian state that is free, that is also democratic, and is also not under a security dilemma itself. Then we can move towards addressing many of these issues simultaneously. Right. Basically, there needs to be an alternative in order for for there to be uh, for war motion, right? Um, and continuing on kind of that, that topic, in Southern Europe, um, migration seems to be one of the most discussed topics, right? Um, when it is discussed, the migrants mentioned are often those coming from other parts of the same region, uh, you know, from the Mediterranean, basically. And yeah, um... Could you give us a view on the reality of these migrant fluxes? Um, from the region itself, I think yes. that we... Well, the reality is that I hate to have like this theory of everything, right? But in 2015, we saw the migrant crisis. Now, I want to just put it into context that approximately... When we look at the 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 sort of the pin the the pinnacle of the migrant crisis in 2015, it was 1.2 million migrants to Europe, the richest continent in the world, and a cap. You know, you compare that to Lebanon, which is a state of four million, at the height of the Syrian civil war and the 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 displacement, the human catastrophe that was caused by that, it hosted 1.5 million. So. It hosted more refugees um, than the entirety of the European continent in 2015, despite the fact that it is 
<clears throat> doing exceptionally poorly on just about e every economic indicator you want to look at. And rather than respond to the, the nature of that central crux of displacement, which was the, the Syrian civil war, Europe decided to create um, agreements with Turkey in 2016 to basically pull up a shutter to um, offshore its migrant policy towards a state that has a very, very questionable human rights record. And it continued to do the same thing. The EU continued to do the same thing, has done the same thing with Lebanon this year, because we've increasingly seen um, migrants leave Lebanon by boat from its northern second city, the second largest city in the north in um, Tripoli, not to be confused with Libya's Tripoli, um, which has also seen significant um, migration to the likes of Italy, um, Tunisia, Morocco. Um, we've seen continued EU offshore agreements with Egypt. Um, it, Italy has agreed its own bilateral agreement with Libya. Um, and Tunis as well. And all these states currently have regimes that are not only questionable in terms of how they deal with refugees, but very, 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 very seriously um, degrading human rights um, with policies of refoulement, which is the, the returning of refugees illegally to the countries of origin, even though they're not safe, and detention and torture as well as other policies around labor that don't allow um, refugees who have now been there long-term to ability to integrate or to provide even the barest dignity in their daily lives. That's Europe's response. The response should be, I think, to engage in a series of diplomatic <laughs> uh, um, efforts to reduce the central causes of conflict, which are not a surprise. They, we understand that the Gaza conflict is fueling displacement. We understand that nearly 100,000 Lebanese, over 100,000 Lebanese have been displaced from the south of the country that may result and will likely result in further, um, further attempts to migrate into Europe. These are not like terribly surprising and shocking uh, um, causal events that cannot ever be understood. They're very A, B, C. So engaging in a better foreign policy that, and it's, that engages its near ally in Israel to reduce the, um, to come to the table, and obviously um, the EU has lever levers inside of Europe as well, to come to the table to reduce tension on the border would take a significant step in the right direction. Similarly, um, we've seen uh, Gert Fielders, no surprise, uh, in the Netherlands say that Syria is safe. Syria is not safe to return. Basically, it's a policy of pushing out uh, refugees who have found asylum in the Netherlands. We have a, a significant problem within Europe, and I would I really appreciate this channel to, to, to talk on in particular because amongst left-leaning uh, commentators and um, and politicians, we have responded terribly to to the the right wing rhetoric on on displacement. We've given up almost entirely the idea that it, this is a human rights issue. This is an issue around catastrophe and providing safe haven. To sort of mealy mouth and weaselly way to say, well, we need migrants because you know our economies do better with them. Our economies do do better with migrants. Yes, that's very very true. But that's not the reason why we created the 1951 refugee agreement. That's not the reason why we created um, a policy of ensuring freedom of travel and freedom of commerce, because we actually believe that in some sense that people should be able to travel and create better lives for themselves in different places across Europe. And indeed, stretching that out to our near neighborhood in places where people are experiencing difficulties and are fleeing conflict. But instead... We securitize the problem and we securitize the issue, which is, as I said at the start, in terms of per capita hosting, is not a great, is not a great burden. And the, the off, and the off uh, put benefits that we get from adding those migrants into our workforce and our labor refreshes a lot of our economies. But instead, we sit on our hands and worry about like 
the potential outflanking of characters like Nigel Farage and Garfield and Marine Le Pen. When we should, and we can see that very clearly in centrist politics as well, in centrist politicians. Um, I think that we can look at Macron as an example and tell that he has very clearly sort of operationalized his um, his rhetoric on migrants and refugees and asylum seekers significantly to the right of where centrist politics used to be, especially when you look at um, new labor under Tony Blair. So what do we do about this? I think that it's up to us on the left space to frame this in the in the correct way, which is um, an issue of tackling these issues at source. If you sure, if you want, which is great because we want people. Because I've been working with um, refugees and displaced people on them on a number of different continents, from uh, Rohingya refugees in Myanmar to Burundians, um, DRC, and South Sudan, Lebanese and, and Syrian refugees, Jordanian refugees. I'm yet to meet refugees that really have the the overwhelming picture that is painted, which is refugees who are desperate to come and take advantage of Europe's great benefit system, which they can't really take advantage of un- legally anyway. Um, they're dying to uproot their, their families and dying to take risks across continents and uh, in dinghies. They're dying to like, basically try and roll three sixes on a dice table to potentially make it to Europe. This is not, I've not encountered refugees who have said this. Um, What most people want to do is live in their communities that their families have lived in for generations to build those communities and to live free and prosperously. So if our development policy was more supportive and conducive of that by ending long-term conflict and also offering the opportunity for more people to legally arrive in Europe, and we actually supported their in integration into the economy and, and uh, social structures, we'd see a lot less outflanking by, quite frankly, you know, the worst of our, our of our political elements that are continuing to grow. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, that kind of section of the left that is very like, oh, yeah, they just you know, they, they make our world better, they make our cities better, um, our economy better, like you said. And then, you know, that sort of takes away from saying, okay, um, this is a human rights issue, but it's also a political issue within these people's home countries that, have you ever stopped and thought that maybe their dream is not to come here and be your like perfect victim maybe you know people are here because they have to you know most of the times um and you know i think there's yeah that kind of like you know very yeah um, childish in a way but also it it it's kind of a need for a victim right for like this Mm -hmm. nerd victim that like is actually coming to you and like making your city better you know just this oh, i don't know I, do you see what i mean does that make sense yeah. to you this sense of like really yeah paternalistic condescending kind of please be my victim instead of you know placing the problem where it should be which is again a human rights issue but also a political issue in these different countries Right. And, and and look, this is one of the, the reasons that I became very interested in displacement. And usually I teach this to students was to show that there's not really objective researcher objectivity. Right. You know, my grandmother was a, an Armenian refugee um, from the genocide in Turkey. Um, my grandfather was a Syrian whose family migrated into Lebanon. My father himself migrated from Lebanon. So I'm a child of, refu- you know, a grandchild of a refugee and, and, <laughs> and a child of migrants. This is a deeply personal story to me. Um, and my study in it is that it's, it's layered in the ways that you said, right? It's layered in the, in the fact that we can understand from a hosting, a uh, hosting dynamic more broadly, how do we relate to refugees? Do I, in, I instinctively um, and innately never frame it as, you know, it's always um, the, 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 the crisis, the migrant crisis. 
rather than a crisis of opportunity or a crisis of discourse. It's much more about hosting dynamics. Regardless of how of our of our painted reality, places like the UK, like Spain, like Italy have seen successive mi migration is a part of human history. I don't think that we should stop it. I think that we should facilitate it in a ways that keep us connected across borders, that keep us uh, connected um, and states engaged in as positive relations as possible. And the infantizing sort of nature of that really undermines the agency that different refugee groups have whenever you see them as a as a monolith one, right? Each sort of group has, ha, each person has a different story for why they have fled a country. Um, potentially some of them might be fleeing um, for cultural reasons. They be belong to the LGBTQI plate plus community. Um, they may be a Syrian opposition to Bashar al-Assad. They may belong to an ethnic minority. Just that's, a, that's only giving one, one potential place. But oftentimes well, that sort of idea that they're just a, a victim who, do, who has no agency paternalizes and infantizes a group that you then automatically then have to like look after, right? Which automatically plays into the right position that these people are going to be a drain and boats are illegal and they're just coming here not to contribute. The fact is, is that, you know, especially in the UK context, what is British culture, right? British culture, for me, the best parts of British culture include, include the Windrush generation, not sort of um, polite society, uh, only white Downton Abbey kind of Britain, but also a multicultural menage that its empire massively benefited from. It massively enriched itself from, right? And we see sort of elements of like its art, its politics. I mean, the kind of identity infantizing that happens is, oh, look, we had an Indian pro former prime minister. And it's like, okay, on one hand, it, we kind of like roll our eyes and say, well, okay, well, he doesn't perform, you know, at all any kind of politics that helps migrants nowadays. But at the same time, it shows that within the, U um, the UK context that different cultures have amalgamated and integrated and effectively integrated, that they can become the landed gentry class. They can become <laughs> effectively, I don't know, he's not a bit, him and his wife are not billionaires, but they're very, they're very, very well off. So it's not like they're, you, you, you can climb to the top of the social circles by, you know, from families of migrants. This is opportunities to be successful. And I think that there's a very insidious and uh, part of like the discourse that suggests that every culture that comes and arrives into Europe is alien rather than understanding where coffee, you know, I know you're Italian and we understand, you know, I'm a great lover of coffee yeah. and, you know, coffee was not an Italian. You may be very good at it, but it wasn't an Italian um, <laughs> invention that there, we look around for all these different elements of our cuisine our culture and it is infused it's an amalgamous and it's an amorphous mass and that's where i sort of call for a cosmopolitanism and, a, and an ability to see beyond the monolith an example that i would give the insidious sort of language that crops up is that alien cultures are arriving and they don't have a concept of italian values or british values and we or french values and we see this repeated ad nauseum whereas the, let them stay in the regions where they are local and where the cultures are same Lebanese are not immediately looking at Syrian refugees and looking at them as, oh, our cousins, let's open up our arms to you. Initially, there was a significant welcoming of refugees into Lebanon, but now we see elements of curfews and torture and lynchings, for, for God's sake. That doesn't sound like, you know, inherent cousin or brother-sister relations, but based Kafala on culture. system, right? Yes, based on foreign domestic workers, right, which is a modern day slavery. So, and even some foreign domestic workers come from Arab, Arabic speaking or Muslim countries, but they don't, they're not seen as, um, as, as a, you know, as a cousin who's automatically going to integrate. And you're talking about states that are neighboring one another. I mean, it, it's not that long ago that you can look to how UK, how British people talk about Germans or talk about French. If there is a mass uh, 
Huguenot Part II um, uh, evacuation from France into the UK, would they automatically see them as like as cous European cousins? There's always going to be a discourse around migration that is negative. There's always going to be people that feel potentially under threat that that new groups are coming in. And it's not our job to tell them that they're racist or to tell them that, you know, that that they're just having misplaced fears, but to understand the very real um, impacts demographically, culturally, that this economically that this has and to outline broader concepts of nation and state and humanity um, and culture as well. And it's not a there is I haven't in the 15 years that I've been working and studying on this, been able to come up with like a clever little catchphrase that enca encapsulates all of that. Um, and that's where that's where we fall down whenever we talk about displacement. And it's important that we do better. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely difficult um, to deal with it. Like on, on the left, you know, it's uh, it's a, a question of, I guess, what approach do you take? And, you know, I think it does go back to what we were we, what we were at Brad before about, you know, Orientalism and maybe. I don't know, maybe it's a question as well of saying this is absurd uh, in either direction and we need a more we need a more humanist uh, left, right? Perhaps um, and a more humanist yes. yeah, uh, environment, you know? Yeah, generally. Generally, <laughs> generally. Yeah. Um, do you see it a lot on the left though, like humanism? Like, or do you think it's a... Uh, something that's lacking i don't see those binding con concepts as much as i should i think that you know it's no surprise that you know you and i agree on this i think um that we see that retreat into identitarian online meme culture a lot more or gotcha culture or tribalism however you want to call it you do see a retreat in terms of a reflexive retreat to, oh, this person automatically hasn't opened up their arms to refugees, I'm going to just assume that they're a Nigel Farage supporter and therefore they have no cause to understand any of the different sort of dynamics. The fact is, is that there's a there is a global dynamic that is impacting um, more marginalized communities and i include class communities in that as well um the fact is is that significant displacement and migrate and migration usually um puts pressure on working class communities because that's where a lot of migrants and asylum seekers are shoveled into so communities that are already under economic pressure start to feel an uh, a potential increase in people that don't look like them and are and, and that issue becomes instrumentalized. So whenever we actually talk about these issues, we have to be really integrative. And I think that we lack the, the sort of, there is a lot lacking in that compassion to, to sit with someone who maybe have, maybe has listened to the instrumentalization of people like Nigel Farage, who, of course, the problem with a lot of these um, right-wing populists is that they take a small kernel of truth, which is people are doing worse, and then instrumentalize it to the target that gets them the easiest and quickest votes. So it's up to us not to fall into that trap. It's also up to us to make sure that we can actually like build a better understanding of, and I don't say multiculturalism, because there are very real questions that people have about um, their rule of law and their societies and how people should be governed generally but cosmopolitanism right this is like a, a concept of integrating along broad conceptual values of humanity and being able to engage in a daily um a daily life that is your pursuit of happiness and and working towards those means but we have i think that the prospect of displacement has become almost like an anathema to like leftist politics in a lot of ways because we we don't want to touch it and you rightly said and and, and i really want to hammer this point that it is a two-way conversation right integration isn't just you integrate here there is also well ask me how i integrate 
what I provide the culture. Um, uh, oftentimes people talk about the economic miracle of Southern Ireland, the Celtic tiger. I don't know if you've heard of this on the backs that it was fueled by migrants, right? It was a significant freshening up of the economy that came from mostly a bulwark of Eastern European states, but also beyond that um, economic development, that very hyper liberal economic new liberal economic development, which we've begun to see backlashes in Ireland about, um, was a significant increase in like the internationalization of the the country, increase in language proficiency, increase in in sort of a, a general sort of feeling of like of of the of of a more international Ireland that was outward looking and not only a case of sending its people to the rest of the world, but started to be a central hub and community for the rest of the world to engage in. And it's really, really that two-way dynamic. And I think that we don't get there without building a better understanding of how we have conversations around these key issues and not automatically throwing um, people under buses because um, they may have potential concerns that they articulate. Um, it's up to us to understand them and to attach them to the wider forces at work that seek to um, undermine all of our well-being. Right, absolutely. And, you know, I think going back to what you were saying also about, you know, like what we want, like just to be happy, right, to be stable, like we fundamentally want the same things. And I would love for there to be like more focus on this uh, rather than, than on like the minimum, the most like minute difference, like on okay, actually, yeah, we do want the same things. We do need the same things. And, you know, I think the way that we get to actually unite people and, you know, avoid this kind of more racist uh, attitudes is actually through working together for a common goal, which mm -hmm. there is a common goal, you know? Uh, and, and I think it is, my opinion, class struggle but i wanted to ask you yes. uh what would be a productive and class-based approach to the situation in the mediterranean to the the crisis um in general of the mediterranean you know uh whether that be for the people who are having to migrate to southern europe or for the southern europeans that are migrating to northern europe because they also can find good jobs that they dream of doing mm -hmm. um you know for for a situation that really is you know something has to give because at yeah. this point uh, you can't mm -hmm. even rent a flat um and yeah. yeah and on the one hand there's you know the downwardly mobile middle class uh mm -hmm. that i think you know we need to really reassess who are, we are aligning with and then mm -hmm. yeah the working class that is made of both migrant workers but also yeah workers from you know southern italy uh mm -hmm. or the whole of italy mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. uh spain greece portugal south of france you know what like knowing this region fundamentally uh and also yeah including the Middle East, um, in all of its diversity, is there a common class struggle that can be fought? What are, what are the alliances, um, the internationalism that could take place? How would it look? Realistically, <laughs> potentially, or, or as, a, as, a, as a wish list? I mean, I guess realistically, if you have to say that there is no chance here, let's let's focus <laughs> on another thing. Or, you know, what are the how can we build the possibility for politics within this region? You know, that's maybe we haven't even gotten there yet. I, I don't think we, we, we have gotten there yet at all, to be honest. No. So, you know. I, I would agree. I, I don't think we're there yet. I think that we have seen. OK, so I would sort of suggest that the wider concept, and I, I don't know how you feel about this, but like borders or violence generally, I would, my wish list is that we do live in a cosmopolitan world that goes beyond nativism, but we are right smack bang in the middle of, I hope in the middle of a nativist wave. God knows I said this like in 2018, I was like, I think we've reached the crest of this global, like right-wing nativist populism and 
on and on it continues, which is an important point because it sort of says that there is a crystallizing of identities that is happening right now globally that is retreating into, as you mentioned, and I think it's, you know, I'd like to shame a lot of leftists by like engaging in this rhetoric, but if we we see the crystallization of narrow ethnic, religious, nation-based identities, and we see from Modi in India, Trump, Le Pen, like we're we're seeing this all over, right? And our answer should not be to further crystallize and draw borders and boundaries about what it means to be human and to engage in 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 civil society and to engage in democracy and i think that moving beyond my down with the westphalian system extremism right <laughs> which a lot of people might say um although i will point out the eu like one of the eu concepts that i do like is freedom of movement obviously it's like freedom of movement for who for what certain groups and inclusive, you know, it's a very inclu exclusive, inclusive system. Um, I do like the central principle of being able to do it. Going back to the Arab Spring, um, it was important that someone like me who was doing my PhD at the time and looking at um, the central wrongs of colonialization through the mandate period and the Sykes-Picot agreement and the thrice promised land of Pal Palestine, which were clearly, obviously, very clearly dealing with the outcome of that conflict. What was interesting about like that very youthful expression of dem popular demonstration was that the calls on the street weren't to get rid of the nation states as they existed right now. They were to democratize those systems. And I'm very, 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 very keen on underlying that increasing democratization, not just and broadening that concept out from, hey, I get to vote in elections every four years. Isn't that great? I'm part of a democracy, but bringing democracy to our workplaces, bringing democracy to many publics, to deliberative democratic actions, to being able to create institutions and mechanisms that allow people to have more, more people to have more of a say and to hold their, their political leadership to account. Since 2019, um, when Lebanon has undergone what the World Bank called, um, and take that as you will, but it's the World Bank, I know, but like what they called the worst economic crisis of the last 150 years, that I've often said this to people who and students who who express more libertarian values. I was like, if you really want to understand what libertarianism looks like at its end game, you visit Lebanon. Where if you had enough money, you could honestly, even right now, you'd probably not even notice the fact that the country's at war. Maybe you would maybe affect some of your friends, but you would be isolated in a compound that you just needed to pay someone off. You didn't need to go through any government regulations. You could have brought in outside contractors. You could have used slave labor. Could have used slave labor. You could have done any number of things that you know that that uh, that exist in a libertarian's wet dream. The problem is, is that it become that everyone becomes a pilot fish for those bigger and bigger actors, and that we're just all suddenly just like hoping that we get hand me downs, and this creates extreme amount of clientelism where like i would say people like oh corruption is endemic in lebanon i don't think it's endemic in lebanon it is the system and this is what happens whenever you just let unregulated capital just flow foreign local just flow um through the country and constellate into several key actors so my op opinion would be that we support those who and I mean, I made this point at the time that like even on 2019, when there was an awakening in Lebanon and a mass protest about what had happened, um, the economic disaster that we were confronted with, I, I, I was suggesting that even if you're like an, a kind of, and I have many friends who exist on their economic right, um, some of my best friends, um, that you are my my brother, my comrade in arms, they may not like that language, but you're my comrade in arms right now, because at least we argue broadly and conceptually to our previous conversation about how do we broaden these concepts out, at least we agree that we want an accountable state, 
that we can just ensure that we can start fragmenting this this nepotistic clientelistic state and start pulling that apart so my general consensus and probably my where i settle on this internally and to make it more palatable for those who kind of maybe don't have a more of a pro-social outlook and a more let's look after each other um, through social welfare and other kind of like more socialist um, policies is that we can all agree that we kind of want to have more say in our daily lives. We can all agree that we want to engage in politics more in our daily lives. We can all agree, some people don't, but what I mean to say that is that wouldn't you like a boss that listened to you more? Or wouldn't you like a boss that uh, that sort of that took your great ideas on board? Wouldn't that be great if we can go walk through societies and have and genuinely feel that we could have an impact in building it more? And that comes, and I'm not here to police how people want to get there. I mean, sometimes in my fantasies, I think about saying fuck it and then building a commune on the other side of the world. Um, and that's a very, very local sort of, you know, a hyper local element of, 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 of uh, engaging that greater democratic ideal, but at a minimum, giving more say to more people in our politics, in our workforce. I think that, and that in regards to how we interact with um, near near neighborhood, as the EU would say, is to support the is to support people who are like engaged very very readily and at great personal cost to them selves um the the attempts to democratize to further further democratize the their own states that they engage um you you know unfortunately i i started by or uh, talking about the arab spring and the great hope that that came with you know we're we're now probably even further away from achieving some of those democratic ideals than we were back then I mean, certainly Syria is, um, Tunisia has regressed. A lot of these democratic indicators have regressed, Egypt. And that's a very sad state of affairs. And we have to hold our hands up in terms of our foreign policy in terms of, and just sort of roll back onto engaging with su securitizing actors by, believe, by believing that they keep migrants out, by believing that they keep terrorism, a lid on terrorism. These kinds of actors um, that we see in control of autocracies really um, undermine not only the long-term benefit of the, the country that they're in, but also the democratizing benefit of the region around them, and also potentially a democratizing element for further afield. So how do we support these actors who are great costs trying to to build better societies for the for the worlds around them i think would be a very very able and important first step right uh yeah and and i completely agree on the importance of uh, de democratic you know nations but also workplaces um democratic and more accountable because right now the, there is no accountability and it's used as like a sort of both are used as a private playground. Uh, so yeah, redistribution of power is is absolutely, absolutely key. Um, to end on a more hopeful note, because we don't want to send everyone away in a depression, which we definitely will. But you know, um, I did want to ask you, uh, what is the role of humor and levity? in politics, Good, you know, things like comedy, sports, poetry, and other forms of shared sort of like pride and beauty, uh, which I have to say don't currently reign on the left. Um, could they help us on our arduous way to what, you know, Sally Rooney would call a beautiful world? Uh, <laughs> and how do we complement this with the sort of capital P, fundamental i think politics of a uh, class struggle sorry i'm just like overcome with the idea of sally rooney and uh, right now because downstream it's i totally blame her for the you talk about beauty for the the reoccurrence of the mullet because 
every Irish kid between 20, oh, even younger, 17 to 32 is out there getting a mullet, hoping that it'll turn them into Paul Miscal. And it's not going to turn them into Paul Mescal. Like, I hate to break it to you, lads. It's it's really not. And I'm sure I haven't read Normal People. Maybe you have. Maybe he described him as having this kind of mullet. But anyway, besides the point, I think that, um, you know, as my friend, you know, departed friend Michael Brooks was very important, like, person in American leftist politics to not only have a global and cosmopolitan outlook, but to do it with humor to not hold ourselves to account. And I don't know um, if you're familiar with the British uh, comic, uh, Mark Thomas. So he's a political, a British political comic. And I saw his stand up with my brother many years ago that he said that um, he always, like he created the Mark Thomas comedy product, which was talking about various different political issues through the, through humor. And um, he'd build a stand up routine around it and he'd do various skits, think, Borat Ali G, but politically more, much more politically minded. And he said something very insightful that stuck with me for years that he said he'd go into comedy clubs, uh, or sorry, he'd go into leftist clubs and he would say, he'd, he'd say, okay, let's talk about East Timor. And there'd be a group, an audience that wouldn't laugh, but they would, they would tick off the boxes. Yes, that's something I really need to talk about. Thank you. And let's talk about Sudan and South Sudan. Yes, that's some very important. Thank you for talking about it. And no one would laugh. So then he'd throw out a dick joke. And then everyone would, you know, everyone would be like, oh, my God, this isn't on our agenda. And how dare you speak about this right now? And he'd then go to comedy clubs and he would say he'd give a dick joke and everyone would laugh and they'd go, ha, that's hilarious. And then he'd give another one and then he'd give another one. And then eventually he would say, oh, what about East Timor? And everyone would be questioning, go, what the fuck is East Timor? Someone would say, oh, I think it's near the clitoris and blah, blah, blah. So he, uh, he adequately summed up the fact that there is an extreme disconnect, I think, between common leftists and especially online. I think, I think this always existed, but potentially more online. And a number of friends, I uh, quote them as saying that like laptop leftists and people who are like, I've made a stand today by like, you know, talking shit about Coca-Cola or whoever or Nestle. And that's great. And we should do that, you know, whenever you feel it, it's within you to do, but you're not aloof from culture. You're, you are a distinct and important consumer in all of this. So why not try to engage in it in a meaningful, non-tokenistic way around? I mean, talk about, I, I mean, so it's going to sound like such a dickhead thing to say, but like, you know, I'm, I love sports. I love training. I have engaged in contact sports all my life, including a number of martial arts and I skydive and blah, blah, blah. Like on a, on a, a which isn't particularly great on the climate. Um, <laughs> and it's maybe not, you know, the most leftist thing to do to take a tiny airplane with three people and then jump out of it. But the point being is that a lot of these things might, um, might be seen as like more masculine in nature, right? And this is something that as not just a feminist, but someone who writes from using feminist methodologies and feminist scholarship might sort of be diametrically opposite. But there is, there is a way that we can synthesize our daily nature for actually engaging in the politics around us. The fact is, is that humans through culture and through our different art and, um, what we create, whether it's beauty, whether it's fashion, whether it's um, different uh, types of uh, poetry, which is something I like to do, or films um, express our daily positionalities. And I think that rather than seeing ourselves as wagging a finger and um, at people who don't do it right, or who do it prob- in a problematic way, that we should just create our own, because culture is an inter- it's an it's a conversation, right? We shouldn't just police it. We should actually engage in it more meaningfully, and that way make our point um, within the wider corpus of our engagement. So, I think that go out there, try to do um, your stand up or whatever way that you engage in the world around it, and have your politics that is hope that and don't be on, on the cookie cutter. 
<laughs> that there isn't, there shouldn't be any one singular, we've seen multitude of different feminist waves, right? And some of us maybe sort of feel more intrinsically like connected to certain feminist waves than others. Um, but it's not an end point to just say, I'm a first wave feminist or I'm a second wave feminist. That's it. I'm done. Um, it's it's actually intrinsic on us to continue to have these conversations and to point out where um, the rubber meets the road in various cultural events that why we believe what we believe on individual levels and spend our time more time developing that culture and creating that art rather than wagging the finger and telling other people that they can. Yeah, uh, I'm with you, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, if we didn't uh, go into this idea that uh, our politics is our private life and our arti artistic creations, then we would actually be doing, you know, politics some, in another space. And those spaces would be left for risk, you know, exploration, mm -hmm. creativity, um, examination of like our not just our identity, but like who we really are uh, and who we want to be and like also have fun, you know, have <laughs> fun, be healthy. Like, I think those things are very hard to do when you get to, you know, the middle of the month and you have to keep checking how much do I have mm -hmm. left. And I get that. But at the same time, that doesn't shouldn't mean that we... <laughs> you know, act like losers, like maybe, <laughs> maybe I, I mean, try and, you know, you know, I get it. I get it though. You know, people are trying to like, in what you said, we're under increasingly increasing pressure. And this is my humanism expressed both ways, right? We're, people are under even more pressure today than they were 70 years ago. And we we'll have all these common memes about like, your parents leave school with a high school education and first job for that they have for 30 years and they buy a house and blah, blah, blah. That's all that contains significant kernels of truth. But at the same time, it, it's, it's really important that we don't give those up because what else is it? What else are we fighting for? I mean, what else do we like? How else do we engage in, in, in shaping the world around us? If we just sort of, more and more um and it's a very very privileged thing for me to say because obviously like it is really difficult to live but a lot of collectives and a lot of great art is not done because you know our jobs depended on it it's done in collaboration with others it's done in collectives with creating collectives that are ideally now um cross-border more readily cross-continental even i mean i talked about michael he was a great friend and you know I think that it was important that a lot of people internationally saw what he did because they're like, I recognize this. And those kind of transnational and continental um, solidarity is really, really important for creating a, a critical mass of people who search for something generally. And what was very important about his life and his work was that it was about creating that connection and about creating an understanding about mm -hmm. saying it's, and he, you know, I mean, he went on air and off air, like fiercely problematic jokes, right? But it wasn't the point that that was being made. The point was, is that here are the forces that are really enslaving us. Can we move towards an understanding of that? And can we like actually have a laugh while we're doing it? Can we actually, because, you know, I personally wouldn't be able to get through my day if I didn't, even if it's like dark humor. Oftentimes, yeah. as I said, as you mentioned, I'm Northern Irish Lebanese. And one thing that a number of, of, of scholars that I know who are Northern Irish but have studied in Lebanon go, there's a, there's a, there's a real like connection between the humor. <laughs> it's just like whenever you grow up in violence or a violence has been a pervasive element in the society, you have to get through your dark humor. And um, there's a number of authors, writers that are a testament to that. Um, obviously, there are other ways of doing it, but like that's just a that's a, a way that a way that intrinsically appeals to me. So I think that you know there has to be a, a common sense of of solidarity that that binds us. That isn't just about like you know what leftist interactions did you have today? Like mm -hmm. let's try and build a wider community that understands 
um, the forces at work um, that understands where there are real issues with inequality, like inequality is our biggest issue, both like it is fundamentally, it drives climate change, it drives displacement, it drives violence, it drives everything. Mm -hmm. So if we can address these um, in the different manifestations, if we understand that's different manifestations, then we can address it through culture and politics all at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I think it's important to have people that um, on the left that come at it from, yeah, from actually being able to also have fun and to make those jokes like Michael did. And, mm. you know, I think um, I shared the idea. I think it was uh, Spanish philosopher Clara Serra, Guayrilo. I think it was her saying like, you know, that some women are feeling a little annoyed, to say the least, by some parts of feminism, of the feminist movement uh, that are a little defeatist and, you know, all about like reminding ourselves of how bad we have it. Uh, and she was kind of warning us and, and I would say that, you know, I, I would warn us ourselves um, from, you know, this tendency uh, leading to women actually go kind of going to the right, uh, going to right wing <laughs> figures such as you know, the Asayuso, who's like this um, government figure in uh, in the local government of Madrid, uh, actually being, you know, this kind of woman that goes like, no, you can have everything. Believe me, you're great. You're so cool. You're the best. We can, we can get it all. We can have it all. Uh, and I think it's honestly cause for concern that like some women might actually go in that direction because they feel like they're, you know, their desire to, to, to win, you know, to win in life mm -hmm. in general is not being heard. And like, you're being told to mm -hmm. keep small, keep silent, you know, just don't ever, uh, yeah, think that we might achieve or be something epic, you know, not obviously not just mm -hmm. as yourself, which is actually, yeah, reactionary and kind of not a way to go, I think, but as, no. as a group, as a class, uh, you know, mm. actually that relation to something a little more, a little more winning and cooler and more interesting and, you know, like, like some sort of glimpse of a victory of some kind. Mm. Uh, and I don't know, I think even with men, like I would be really sorry if some men feel like they need to go to Jordan Peterson or like Andrew Tate to feel, you know, validated. And that's why I'm really you know excited about people like you you know you said you you do a lot of sports you you're also an expert at that so that's great uh michael was someone who was absolutely you know a, a model like an example of um yeah masculinity or even just being a leftist and being you know someone who clearly had a big heart uh, and was there for people and like saw people's humanity, but also being able to have fun, you know, and I think that point that balance is something we should we should all strive for. You said it perfectly. I, I would just echo that like, um, the final point. Um, I think that, you know, there's a Michael was very interested in like how people like Tate and Peterson took root. And it comes back to like my work with like radicalization and my work with like um, uh, other people who found themselves in violence is that there's often a sense of like searching for belonging and searching for belonging. And if your belonging is said, you belong in this category, mm -hmm. therefore that the binary nature that the Peterson and Tate create, they create stories about what it means to be masculine rather than, uh, and they do it in countercultural reaction to this great leftist enemy that tells you that you can't be a man anymore and you can't do this and that where the reality is is that we shouldn't be governing those things we should have fun we should explore our interests and we should be free to um to explore our lives how we want mm -hmm. there will be some women who want to be housewives right we should have the op and it shouldn't be us to judge them if they're going into um that with their eyes wide open about like that they could have it all if they wanted or they could the option is there for them um both Im implicitly and explicitly yeah. to engage in society and life and not t turn around and say you're just internalizing patriarchy and rather mm -hmm. than you know that's something that you want to do right because in the end women 
have to give up a lot of their lives to have children and that can be a, a great burden and toll and we shouldn't have um a world that sort of tells them right okay because you need to eat and live for you and your baby get back to work after three months like i mean these things don't add up so um being able to enjoy that life and enjoy the sort of different contours of what we want to experience um and being able to not worry existentially whether we're going to eat or not <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, exactly. Maybe that is the ultimate point, you know, uh, give us the material conditions to make our decisions. Um, Ooh, yeah. There you have something that rhymes as well. So poetry, we <laughs> said it, we said it. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Drew, thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Um, like Michael Brooks would say, left is best, despite all the ruthless criticism that I think is needed at this mm -hmm. stage. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for watching. Please do subscribe, follow us, find out what we are up to. And yeah, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me and this wonderful conversation. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.